The colleagues, uh, good afternoon and welcome to a new episode into the uh, e-seminar sessions organized by ERA. Tonight we have a special uh, session jointly organized by UDL and Descartes on behalf of ERA together with European Society of Organ Transplantation. My name is Gabriel Onesco. I'm a transplant surgeon and president-elect of ESOT, and together with uh, my colleague and friend, Adrian Kovic, representing UDL, um, we're happy to welcome you to the session uh, entitled Management of the Failed Transplant Patient Returning to Dialysis. We have a fantastic lineup, and I'm delighted to introduce the two speakers uh, representing ESOT, um, Lucrezia Furian, who's a professor of transplant surgery in Padua, uh, and Olivier Tonat, who's a nephrologist and immunologist in Lyon. Both of them will provide interesting aspects of um, uh, the failing transplant um, patient. And over to Adrian to introduce the panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a very exciting uh, e-seminars. Um, just a couple of words uh, uh, to um, present uh, the idea. Uh, at, at one moment, uh, UDL, which is the dialysis working group, uh, was thinking uh, at one of the most vexing uh, issues uh, presented to uh, the dialysis uh, uh, community, how to deal uh, with the patient returning from transplantation. And actually, uh, data is showing that more and more uh, patients and a higher um, proportion of uh, dialysis program is taken by uh, this category of patients. So actually we decided to ask our colleagues and friends and uh, uh, from the ESOT and uh, Descartes and also the uh, ERA uh, society in its totality to organize this e-seminar. And it is a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, two fantastic panelists. Um, uh, Rachel Hellemans is from Belgium, from Antwerpen, um, um, working with immunology and translational medicine. And uh, Luke Hillebrands, professor at Hörningen, uh, also very um, uh, involved with all dialysis aspects uh, and dialysis pathology. Um, so back to you uh, to start this fantastic uh, uh, e-seminar session. Um, thank you, Adrian, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, first speaker, Olivier Tonat, who's going to speak about the immunology of uh, failing grafts, and not only, I suspect. Olivier, over to you. Thank you, Gabi. I'll do my best. Um, and I'd like to thank, of course, the organizer for this invitation to contribute to this very interesting seminar, very original topic. Uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to try to uh, discuss with you how we manage the failed transplant patient returning to dialysis. As an introduction and to start things uh, slowly, I would say that uh, graft failure is unavoidable. And uh, you have an example of what happened in France between 2007 and 2020. It's a little bit more than, a little bit less, sorry, than the uh, 45,000 kidney transplantation. And you see that uh, whatever you do, this graph will ultimately fail with a median sur survival time uh, of 143 months in, in France. But I suspect this, this uh, picture is pretty much the same all over the world. Why are these graphs failing? Well, it's a complex story and it's uh, usually uh, quite different from one patient to another. This is a typical uh, clinical picture that we have all encountered. Uh, during our consultation, I, I suspect. So you see that uh, in these patients, graph was uh, going well. And then because of this creatinemia slowly going up, we suspect TNI toxicity. Sometimes we prove this uh, problem by doing a graph biopsy. So we reduce the trot level of the immunosuppressive drugs. The patient is not exposed anymore to the same level of, uh, of, uh, of TNI. And as a result, it may develop uh, donor-specific antibodies. And this, of course, uh, will lead ultimately to a uh, graph failure due to antibody negative rejection. But there are many, many other scenarios possible. And in a very interesting uh, um, studies, single standard studies coming from uh, Clemens Buda's group in Germany, uh, you can see that most of the time you can find a primary and a surrounding secondary causes. And all these things look very complex and very different. But at the end of the day, uh, we all know when we take uh, in charge of patients that we are guiding them through a very narrow path between over immunosuppression. And if we, uh, and if we, they fall on this side of the problem that they will have more infections, more cancer, more metabolic and cardiovascular disease, which is of course not good. And if you reduce to, if we reduce too much the immunosuppression, then they're going to have rejection, and this of course will lead to graft loss. 
And uh, as a transplant physician, we used to think that this is what we do when we transplant a patient. But in fact, uh, we need to remember that this problem is carried over, carried uh, over during the next stage when the patient goes back to dialysis. In fact, uh, when the patient loses its graft, of course, uh, it will go back in dialysis. And we tend to think that uh, it will stay in dialysis or it will be retransplanted. But there is another uh, important problem that may arise that these patients can die. And actually, it's not a rare event because after five years, the patient that have uh, lost their graft, uh, are almost 50% of them are, are dead. Uh, in fact, patients on dialysis after graft failure have three times more chance to die than if we, if uh, he was still uh, with a functioning graft when you adjust on all the other variables. And why are these patients dying? Well, it's quite obvious. They die because there are more cardiovascular events when they are back in dialysis and more infectious problems, not so much more malignancy. But as I said before, uh, all these things are potentially uh, magnified, all these problems are potentially make uh, worse because of the immunosuppressive drugs of the patient. So remember these patients were transplanted, they were on immunosuppressive drugs to prevent rejection. When they are back on hemodialysis, we tend to think that they don't need their graft anymore, but they keep these immunosuppressive drugs. And this maybe uh, is a problem because it increased the risk of uh, dying due to cardiovascular disease or infectious disease. So of course, if I say, uh, if I present the problem like this, you will tend to think that, why don't we stop immunosuppression? We don't need it anymore. The graft is not functioning anymore. But if you look at this uh, very recent paper coming from Canada, it turns out that if you stop immunosuppression, you actually increase the risk of death in these patients because you can see here that continued immunosuppression appear to be a protective factor for these patients after a graft loss. Why is that? It seems to be a bit counterintuitive. It's not, of course, from an immunology point of view because if you stop the immunosuppressive drugs in these patients because the graft is still in place and provide the antigen to the immune system, they will uh, develop antibodies against HLA class one and class two. And this allosensitization will make them more, more difficult to retransplant. And you need to think that the major uh, thing you need to do to these patients if you want to avoid, uh, if you want to prevent the death is to retransplant them. This is a very interesting figure coming from a paper I presented before. You see that the patients in blood that you cannot release, probably because they are older or more comorbid, they are dying very fast. But what I would like you to do is to focus your attention on the two other curves, uh, the red one and the blue one. They are both patients that have been listed for transplantation. The blue one are transplanted and the red one are not. They are waiting, they are on a waiting list. And you see that there is a difference in the mortality in these patients. And of course, the main uh, variable that is responsible for the delay in retransplantation is the allosensitization. So think again about what I was saying. When you stop immunosuppression in these patients, they have the graft in place. It's not functioning anymore, but it provides an antigen. They get sensitized. They can, you cannot transplant them anymore, and so they die more. Can we uh, try to get the best, the best of the two worlds, uh, which in your situation would mean that we would try, we would try to find a solution in which patients uh, have, would, would be off immunosuppression, so that their risk to die from infection, metabolic disease when they are back in dialysis would be minimized, but at the same time, you don't want them to be more sensitized because if they are allosensitized, then you cannot transplant them, which is a massive risk for, for, for death. So is there a place, is there a room for allograft nephrectomy in this situation? Well, allograft nephrectomy is a procedure uh, that is quite rare, I would say, and uh, the mortality rates, according to different studies, could range from 0.7% to 7%. And this high huge viability is in fact the, the reflects in fact the fact that we are doing allograft nephrectomy for very different uh, causes. And indications are extremely viable from one center to another. And most of the cases we, we are doing this nephrectomy for cause, either early post transplantation because of a primary surgical failure due to thrombosis or hyperacute rejection, or we are doing that late because for instance, we need room to make, uh, we need room for the, for the next raft and they are more planned. And of course, depending on these very different situations, uh, you understand that the mortality rate is going to be different. So uh, what about the, 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 the impact of uh, these uh, allograft nephrectomy and allosensitization? Well, due to the fact that they, it is very heterogeneous, it makes uh, the, let's say the evaluation of the impact of allograft nephrectomy on allosensitization quite unclear, I would say. 
And I just like to illustrate this point by uh, showing you this study coming from a French group in Toulouse. Uh, you can see there that they, if you compare the two group of patients, uh, it's a small number of patients, uh, less than 50 if I remember well, uh, the black one are the one that have uh, benefit from a graft nephrectomy and the blue one, no graft nephrectomy was performed. You see that the beginning at the time when the graft is lost, then they have pretty much the same level of sensitization. But at the last follow-up, yeah, sensitization tend to be worse in the group that has underwent a graft nephrectomy. And this has led to strange situation where allograft nephrectomy is sometimes um, described in review paper as being cause of sensitization, which from an immunological point of view, of course, don't make much sense. And you need to remember that most of these studies like this one, I thought interesting, are not randomized. They are a mixture of systematic and, and four cause graft nephrectomy. And above all, in this particular case, all immunosuppressive drugs were stopped at dialysis reinitiation, which means that the immunosuppressive drugs were stopped months before graft nephrectomy. So it's likely that in fact, what we are witnessing here is not the impact of the allograft nephrectomy, but the, the impact of the immunosuppressive uh, withdrawal. So what we uh, decided a couple of years ago in my center is that we, we would try to improve this. We would try to use allograft nephrectomy as a way to get rid of immunosuppression in patients back in dialysis. But instead of using uh, allograft nephrectomy for cause, we would do it systematically. We would do it early and we would do it uh, under the cover of immunosuppressive drugs. So this is what we wanted to test. This is the, the proposed strategy that we wanted to test. You see that the patients in my, my center, most of them are under triple immunosuppressive drugs with mycophenolate morphity, but we stop at dialysis reinitiation. We have CNI and corticosteroid. Uh, we organized the nephrectomy within the four, four to six weeks under the cover of CNI, full dose, and corticosteroid. When the graft is removed, we can stop the CNI after 15 days and then slowly the corticosteroid. And most of these patients are off immunosuppression after 12 weeks. And we wanted to know whether this was actually uh, efficient. So we compared that uh, in a randomized study called DESIRE uh, against what we usually do before uh, starting this, uh, this new way of handling the patients, in which we stop MMF, but we keep the CNI progressively tapering the dose and stopping fully, uh, completely stopping the CNI after 24 weeks, and then the corticosteroids after even a longer time period. So this uh, study is, uh, as, uh, is about to be um, uh, finished because we have uh, completed the enrollment of patients and we are now um, analyzing the data. It's unfortunately too early for me to share the definitive results, but I'd be happy to, to answer your question if you have some. And of course, uh, happy to share these results probably at least at the next Lizard Congress in London in 2025. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Oli. Uh, thank you very much, Olivier, for this great um, talk. Um, it's clear that, unfortunately, our kidney transplants, they don't last for a lifetime. So there's a lot of patients um, who experience graft failure. And this is this comes with very complex management decisions, like, like you um, showed we need to do all things together, prepare the patient for uh, going back to dialysis, maybe have a retransplant, and at the same time we have to balance the immune suppression. Um, there are some pros and some cons about um, the, uh, keeping immune suppression on one side. We would like to keep the residual kidney function for as long as possible. We, we try to avoid rejection or uh, HLA immunization, especially in the patients who um, could be candidates for a retransplant. But on the other hand, there's the risk of uh, the immune suppressive treatment on infections, um, um, other complications. So it's really a, a difficult balance to make. And it's a very dangerous pe uh, period for the patient, like you showed with a high mortality, high morbidity in, this, in these patients. But unfortunately, um, so far, we have little or no good quality studies on how to manage 
these patients. And so, so it's really um, opinion based. There is a large variety in practice patterns. So we're really happy that you took on the, uh, the this task to really um, organize a, a, a well-performed, uh, good quality randomized control trial on this topic on uh, should, could it be a good idea to go for uh, allograft nephrectomy um, so to uh, be able to reduce the immune suppression afterwards and um, without um, uh, developing uh, uh, alloimmunity. So we really look forward to the results of your study. It's a, a pity that we don't have them yet, but I look forward to its results uh, soon. Um, you took uh, some years uh, to include all the patients in study, which is, uh, uh, again, a sign of how difficult it is to perform studies like this. So I, I really encourage other researchers to, uh, to take on your example. Uh, because we need much more studies on how to deal with these patients best. Um, personally, uh, maybe we, we can discuss it now or, or, or later uh, during the discussion. Uh, I would be wonder. I, I wonder if you go for a graft nephrectomy. In fact, if I am correct, a, a small part of the of the donor vessels remains in, in the patient's body. And I would be intrigued to know if this could still cause some HLA immunization after the, the stopping of the immune suppression. So yeah, you're right. Um, indeed, uh, the nephrectomy, especially when we perform it uh, late after the transplantation, in late when the uh, when it's not immediate due to primary surgical failure, usually you let a little bit of, of graft. Uh, as far as the, it's probably sufficient to provide a little bit of antigen. Uh, it's probably less than the than the full organ. And uh, whether this has a make a difference as far as the risk of immunization is not known. And it's actually the question that is at the center of the desire study. Uh, you will have to wait a little longer to get the results because I honestly don't, don't have them. We are on the process of doing the centralized analysis of the serum of these patients and define whether they are immunized, protected uh, against allosensitization or not. So that's that's uh, a real question. And uh, indeed, uh, it might be that uh, the strategy is not going to work because we cannot remove everything. I could also say that uh, the, the, the priming of the immune system of the recipients is not solid, solid due, not, not due only to the alloantigens that are in the graph, you know that there are antigen transmitting cells coming from the donor that are inside the graft, and they move to the surrounding of the organ of the recipients very fast after the transplantation. Actually, if you explode the graft after an hyperacute rejection, even uh, you know a day after the failure, usually these patients can get immunized. So it's it's, it's possible indeed that uh, that yeah, we we do not control well the immunity just by removing the graft. It's probably too naive. We we'll see. Yes. Luke, it's, uh, discussion started quite interestingly. Do you have any comments uh, on, on what's been said so far? Thank you, uh, Gary. I think um, uh, Olivier gave a great presentation. Um, I was a little bit surprised by the fact that um, continuation of uh, immunosuppression after a graft failure protects against uh, death. And uh, as with many of these uh, data, it's always difficult to determine whether it's a cause or a consequence. And maybe the patients that were in the worst condition um, were the first ones in whom the physician uh, decided to uh, discontinue the immunosuppression. Could you comment on that, uh, Olivier? Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you're absolutely right. For the sake of telling a story and making the things a little bit you know, linear in the way I was, I was explaining the things, I, I used this, uh, this uh, nice study coming from the Canada that was actually showing that even when you adjust with you know the most likely the most known variable impacting on the death of the patients it seems that uh, staying on immunosuppression 
is something that protects the patient. But of course, uh, you only let the patients on immunosuppression if there is not, uh, you know, a threatening infection, no cancer, uh, if the age is uh, quite low so that you, you intend to retransplant the patient, the patient fast, and all these things are, uh, you know, co-variable. And whether this, uh, you can take into account all these co-variables for me, not true, and it may be that in fact what I was showing is just uh, yeah more in consequence than the cause. And again, I, I know that I was making the things a little bit too simplistic. And and thank you. And and maybe you can also comment on the second issue that's the timing of the graft nephrectomy in your trial. Um, it is independent of the residual graft function, as I understood. And I could also imagine that uh, the balance between preemptive graft nephrectomy. The, the pros and the cons of, of, uh, of that balance are different in patients with and without uh, residual renal function. Yeah, it's it's true. Uh, that that might be a, a problem actually because what you gain on one on one side you may lose on the other side. There is an interesting paper that I've tried to address what is the best timing to put the patients back on dialysis when the graft is failing. And what is kind of interesting in these uh, in these studies is that. It doesn't seem that you do better as far as the patient survival is concerned in dialysis if you put them back in dialysis sooner with more uh, with more uh, residual function. Uh, based on that, I extrapolate that uh, the loss of, of, of uh, graph function when you remove the graph early, uh, as we do in desire study, uh, might not impact too much, but it's true that uh, I don't I don't have proof that it's actually true. And um, for the management of dialysis, you may be completely right. They, they have no longer a residual um, uh, there exists, sorry. And so this makes the life of the patient a little bit more complicated. So yeah, indeed, that's a very good question. That that are things that we need to address and and see when we will do the uh, we write the paper of the desire study. Can I intervene here? Because I think this is an important point and I have a little bit to balance the discussion on the dialysis site. Um, um, taking into account this was a little bit too on the transplant side. So um, do we have from all three of you uh, an answer on, on this very crucial point? Should we start the failing transplant uh, earlier, rather earlier or rather late? Uh, uh, into dialysis, uh, and again, uh, this issue combined with the uh, residual renal function. So, uh, uh, an answer from all both panelists and and um, and uh, the presenter, please, because that's an important point which was discussed with the UDL. Can I start? Sorry, you, you go, Luke. Okay. Well, I, I know the, the, the literature literature data that uh, Olivier just uh, mentioned, and I was a little bit surprised when reading this literature because my in my own experience, I saw the biggest troubles in patients in whom had a had a very uh, bad graft function and were still on uh, full immunosuppressive drugs. So I saw very severe infections, infectious complications in these patients. So I'm uh, um, a little bit reluctant to wait too long to restart with dialysis and to be able to uh, reduce at least the uh, immunosuppressive load in these patients. Rachel? Well, uh, it, it's shown in many studies that um, the, the CKD care in transplant patients tends to be less good than the, the, the care of anemia, phosphate, um, blood pressure, et cetera, in, in transplant naive patients with CKD. Um, so we really need to improve that and have more attention for that. It seems like um, physicians are more focused on management of the immune suppression and a bit um, neglect all the other uh, issues sometimes, uh, which also um, seems to lead to less patients being preemptively waitlisted, transplanted, etc. So I think um, the best thing to do is to avoid dialysis altogether and to go for a preemptive second transplant in patients that are eligible. And so that is really important to start the, the workup for that early enough. Um, and I think that, that we fail 
too too often in accomplishing that in our patients. Okay, we should probably move on to the second presenter, which is Lucrezia Furlan. Um, and uh, uh, then I think we are going to take more questions because questions are uh, arriving uh, 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 a lot. Uh, Lucrezia. Thank you very much, Adrian, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy for this invitation and for having the opportunity to talk about this important topic. I will actually start uh, from uh, uh, the point where Olivier uh, has finished. And uh, uh, I will try to show you that uh, allogra nephrectomy has a very important role, not only uh, in the sense of answering the questions that we have already mentioned, but also uh, we need to think about allogra nephrectomy like a, a group of different surgical operations. And uh, it there, is some, there are some differences among the, the surgical choices that we make in order to obtain different results. So um, I, I'm, you probably know that there have been two very recent papers on the role of allograft nephrectomy published on transplantation. And uh, the key role of uh, allograft nephrectomy has a, a very important uh, um, consequence on the decision of restarting dialysis. You just mentioned that, but I would also add which kind of dialysis. We also have peritoneal dialysis. And if you decide to remove the allograft, you probably will lose totally the production of urine and the, the choice of uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis would be different as compared to hemodialysis. Then uh, we've just heard uh, that uh, allograft nephrectomy has a role in the managing of immunosuppression withdrawal. We don't know whether we should stop immunosuppression the next day after nephrectomy, uh, for example, when you remove the allograft uh, in a very early phase. And uh, it's very important to um, read the results of the study, the, the, Empire, the desired study uh, proposed by Olivier. We have also discussed about immunological risk after graft nephrectomy, and um, I will try to focus more on how to remove it and what are the consequences. And I will widen a bit the topic, discussing um, the workup in the recipient pre-transplant assessment for retransplant, which is kind of different from the naive patient in my view. If we start from the KDGO, um, um, recommendations, we would find that uh, um, they discourage to perform transplant nephrect nephrectomies if, po if possible. And uh, this is quite against what uh, uh, the desired study is proposing, but uh, I think that this recommendation, which is not graded, should be actually reviewed. And one more point that should be reviewed is the fact that a subsequent kidney transplant, uh, if uh, uh, the um, contralateral iliac fossa is already occupied, should be performed uh, through a midline incision instead of uh, going back to the uh, extraperitoneal space. I I'm not sure that there is a high grade of uh, consensus regarding the choice, at least among surgeons. Uh, we have already discussed these uh, indications for allograft nephrectomy, and this, uh, in this case, the allograft nephrectomy has been uh, defined as early, below 12, 12 months, and late, over 12 months. But my suggestion is that uh, we need to also consider a surgical point of view. Early and late allograft nephrectomy should be different, differently uh, divided uh, within one or two months or over one to two months because the surgical technique is very different. And going back to the surgical technique, there are different ways of performing the transplantectomy. We can go extracapsular, which means basically that we have the kidney with the capsule uh, not touched and we can easily access the hilum and have access to the artery, the vein, the ureter, and we really leave a very short uh, uh, length, a short stump of vessels. We don't leave much tissue, as Rachel was asking before, um, remaining of the, of the graft. And that's something that it's possible when you remove the transplant in a very early phase, within one or maybe two months, but it's very um, unlikely to be possible after two months because a lot of fibrosis and adhesions will be there and would make it impossible to be performed. 
The most common technique used in the late phase is the intracapsular technique. Um, and I will show you a picture of the amount of tissue that you will have left from the graft when you use this technique, which is basically the most common. Then you have another option is the transperitoneal uh, technique. So you will go through a midline incision and you will reach the extra peritoneal space uh, going uh, from inside the peritoneum. So you will reach the vessels. But unfortunately, this technique has a very limited number of indications and it may lead to complications to uh, the iliac vessels. There is a series, a small series published where they had to uh, reoperate on the um, arterial iliac axis because of uh, uh, either dissection or uh, stenosis. And then we will talk about embolization, which is not a surgical technique, but something that you may find in the literature. And here you see what you have left after an intracapsular or subcapsular allograft nephrectomy. So basically what we do, we open the capsule, we do a capsulotomy, and uh, we find a very easy plane to be dissected uh, with a finger, and we identify not the hilum itself, but what is close to the hilum. At this point, a vascular clamp is, is placed, and uh, we need to make sure that there is a good femoral pulse to be sure that the iliac vessel has not been touched. At this point, we make a running suture, a uh, second running suture, we release the clamp and the amount of bleeding should be quite low. And if we look at the results of uh, extracapsular versus intracapsular nephrectomy, and here we are talking about late nephrectomies, otherwise the best indication is the extracapsular for early indications, we see that the intracapsular has a shorter operative time, uh, lower estimated blood loss, and what is more important, the percentage of transfused patient is much, much lower. And it also reflects on the mortality and morbidity. It was a bit scary to see that you might die because of graft nephrectomy, but that data, uh, it's a quite a large range from 0.7% to 7%. So I would say that we need to move to the 0.7%. And those cases are, most of the cases are related to early four cause nephrectomies. Um, just to mention something very new from a surgical point of view, that in 2014, they have described the first case report uh, of a robotic transabdominal transplant uh, nephrectomy and uh, uh, two more series have been published since then, one from uh, Phoenix, the other one from Japan. We're talking about five patients, 15 patients, very small numbers. And you see that uh, this uh, surgery can be very mean invasive with only one day of, of hospitalization as compared to um, three, six days in the open nephrectomy, a very small amount of uh, blood loss, but you, you need to look at the operative time, which is almost four hours. So a very challenging surgery. The last option is the uh, embolization. Uh, usually embolization is performed percutaneously and uh, ethanol or microparticles of uh, polyvinyl alcohol or steel coils are injected to the artery and here you can see how is the uh, selective angiography before the embolization and after the embolization that's something that sometimes we do and i will show you later our results and from a meta-analysis published uh, five years ago you can see that uh, uh, the mortality is much lower in case of embolization as well as the morbidity but 68% of the patient display a post-embolization syndrome, 20% uh, of them requiring transplantectomy. And we need to consider that only few indications are uh, adequate for embolization. And I tried to make this scheme just to explain to you that different uh, causes of graft loss lead to different uh, allograft nephrectomy technique. So uh, if you have a very early nephrectomy, allograft nephrectomy, you can go through an extra capsular. So surgical complication, hyperacute rejection, and I would say that you can use it also for early infection and uh, sepsis. And that's good because you remove a lot of allograft. It's not good if you have a malignancy in the graft. And uh, it really depends on the timing, uh, whether you can use the extra capsular for recurrence of primary disease, uh, uh, if you need to withdraw immunosuppression, and uh, or for graft intolerance syndromes. 
Uh, the intracapsular is very much used, as I said before, in case of uh, late, more than longer than two months uh, uh, graft uh, nephrectomy uh, for uh, different causes, but I wouldn't use it for de novo allograft malignancies unless it's a very small malignancy, but in such a case now nephrectomy is usually not performed anymore. Then transperitoneal, uh, I would say that doesn't have uh, many indications, definitely I would avoid it if the patient has an infection or a, a graft-induced sepsis, but it can be uh, the best option if the patient has a de novo allograft malignancy because the surgery will become uh, much more uh, effective and will remove totally uh, very nicely the, the tumor uh, up to the, the bladder. And of course, uh, let me mention if the kidney is placed intraperitoneally, as in the case of simultaneous pancreas kidney, or for those cases with robotic assisted kidney transplant, it's a, a, a good option to perform a transperitoneal. And the uh, last uh, point is embolization. As you can see, there are a lot of red uh, uh, unhappy faces because I would avoid it for surgical complications, hyperacute rejection, sepsis, uh, uh, retransplant, of course, because you would not leave room for a new transplant malignancy, but it can be evaluated for late uh, um, nephrectomies, functional nephrectomies in case of graft intolerance syndrome. In our center, uh, what we perform now after a short phase of pilot study that I'm showing you here, we perform both the percutaneous embolization and the transventectomy. And what we have noticed that is that, uh, of course, I'm talking about late uh, allograft nephrectomy, not early uh, transplant nephrectomies. For these cases, uh, we had a very nice reduction of blood loss, and uh, we also had uh, a reduction of intraoperative blood transfusion. Uh, the operative time is, is shorter, and uh, yeah, we care very much about blood transfusions also postoperative because we expect to retransplant these patients. And also hospitalization was, uh, uh, was shorter. Um, I'm interested in knowing if someone else is using the same technique, but I have to say that here, uh, the mortality is zero, and uh, um, I would say that the surgery takes uh, something like 40 minutes. So it's something that it's very affordable, even for a patient with a lot of comorbidities um, from an anesthesiological point of view. The very last point is related to the workup in the recipient when uh, you uh, are reevaluating the option of a, of a transplant after a previous failed uh, uh, transplant. And uh, yeah, we know that this patient needs a, a, a very uh, thorough um, workup because they have increased morbidity and mortality as compared uh, with naive patients and they have risk of metabolic infections and malignancies, complications, independently from the current immunosuppression, but I would say for the prolonged exposure to immunosuppression that they have had. But I will now focus uh, on the evaluation of the iliac vessels and the pelvic anatomy, because we need to reconsider those patients with polycystic kidney disease, the patients with vasculopathy, and we need to evaluate if the patient has one or more kidney transplantation iliac fossa in case the patient, for example, had dual kidney transplantation or is going to have a third kidney transplantation. And I'm just showing you here, this is a patient who had experienced, experienced graft loss uh, on the uh, left iliac fossa, but on the right side, he has a polycystic kidney. We need to remember and that sometimes uh, polycystic kidney do not leave enough space for, for a, a graft uh, for a transplant, and uh, we need to decide whether it's better to remove a polycystic kidney or to go to uh, a transplant nephrectomy. Personally, I would remove the polycystic kidney. And that's another case. Um, this is a patient, uh, a young lady. She had two previous transplants. You see, one is very <laughs> difficult to be recognized in the left iliac fossa. The other one is quite large. The patient is very tiny, very lean. And uh, we had to decide which kidney we wanted to remove, considering that one kidney was still producing urine, but uh, the pelvis of the patient was very, very tiny. And we were not sure where to place the kidney in case a new donor would come up. So, um, as a conclusion, the point is that uh, um, when we're evaluating the case for allograft nephrectomy, 
Uh, I think we need to communicate a lot uh, between nephrologists, immunologists and surgeons because all the patients are different and uh, I think that most of the decisions will be, should be personalized and discussed all together. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, and I invite uh, Luke to comment uh, on the situation. Uh, also, there was a sort of a discussion beforehand related to uh, these types uh, and to uh, the, the early versus late related to the uh, graft uh, uh, intolerance syndrome. Uh, so, Luke, would you comment on uh, the talk and uh, uh, these issues, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian and um, uh, Lucretia. It was really a great presentation. Um, I have a comment on a patient with late graft failure and the graft intolerance syndrome. You agree that this is an indication for a graft nephrectomy. And my question is about the timing of the graft uh, nephrectomy. Um, if we assume that um, the graft intolerance uh, syndrome is accompanied by immunological activity and by progressive immunization, uh, would this be an argument to give priority to these patients on the um, planning list for the operations to do a rapid uh, graft nephrectomy instead of waiting uh, for a couple of weeks or even months? Well, thank you for this question. Uh, I think it's very important to be uh, very fast in the decisions for this patient. Usually when we have a uh, clinically significant uh, graft intolerance syndrome, we start with some steroids uh, independently from the decision of allograft nephrectomy just to reduce the size of the kidney and to reduce the risk of, uh, of bleeding. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, after two, three doses of steroids, uh, we proceed rapidly with the graft nephrectomy. Uh, we don't like the idea of leaving the patient in a high dose steroids to uh, take in under control uh, the graft intolerance syndrome uh, because of the uh, collateral effects. Um, we have heard that uh, steroids is the last uh, are the last uh, uh, immunosuppressive drug that is uh, stopped, is withdrawn. But it's actually also the patient that the, the drug that the patient liked the least, and probably has a lot of effects. So yeah, we try not to give too many steroids, and uh, we just start with steroids because it helps surgery and facilitates and, and decrease bleeding. Yeah, maybe the steroids can also be used uh, to bring the patient in a somewhat better condition because sometimes the graft intolerance syndrome is diagnosed very lately in patients who are not uh, doing very well, have fever, have weight loss, have sometimes anemia, or in a bad, in a, in a bad um, feeding condition. So maybe you can also use a short period of treatment with steroids to uh, give some recovery to the patient and then plan the surgery. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. It depends on the condition where you see the when you see the patient and if for how long the patient had the symptoms. But since usually they have fever, our patients refer to the nephrologist as soon as they have fever. And, uh, and so um, usually it doesn't take a very long time. I had a case, for example, of a, a recurrence of HUS, for example. In such a case, we, we were in trouble because we wanted to give some time to the patient to recover, but we knew that there was a, a boost there uh, stimulating the, the HUS. So yeah, of course, I think we need to yeah. try to have the patient in the best condition. Yeah. And then a small question about the combined embolization and surgery. What is the time interval between the um, embolization and the refractory? Either the same day or the next day. And the amount of contrast is so small that even if the patient is on dialysis or is an advanced uh, chronic failure, you don't need to give additional dialysis. And so what we do, we give uh, we do the angiography and the embolization today and tomorrow morning uh, we do the nephrectomy. Um, that's because in our experience now we have done many more cases. We have seen that the post-embolization syndrome is really quite frequent. Okay. I return the word to the chair so that they can uh, manage the, the Q&A. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Um, Rochelle, any comments on what's been said so far um, or any, any reference particularly to the uh, reassessment and timing of reassessment and uh, what to do next? 
Um, well, first, uh, uh, a question about this embolization. Um, I was wondering, you, you, uh, when you just go for embolization and not really planning um, a, a subsequent uh, graft nephrectomy, um, do, do you think that this necrosis of the full kidney could somehow um, induce uh, autoimmunity? So could it be risky to, to develop HLA antibodies, for example? Well, honestly, I never plan for embolization itself. I always plan the hybrid uh, solution, embolization first, nephrectomy after. If for some logistical reasons I cannot do embolization, I go for the allograft nephrectomy, but there is no way to do only embolization in my own experience. The only case I've done, the, the post-embolization syndrome was, I, actually I wanted to do it, but I had it to, I had to delay it for a couple of days and the patient was, uh, was feeling sick. So yeah, I don't want to do it. And I think that embolization is not enough uh, for avoiding uh, the circulation and exposure to uh, the HLA antigens. Uh, because you still have some blood there and you notice it because you do an arterial embolization, you still have some venous flow and you have some capsular vessels uh, and you notice that because when you do the surgery after embolization, there is still some bleeding, some. So there is some blood in there. Olivier? Yeah, I would argue that not, not only you don't prevent, I think, allomization by embolization, I agree with Lukasha, but you could, you have very strong indirect immunological uh, data supporting that it would it should be a, actually a situation where you would increase it because you create necrosis, which is a very immunogenic cell death, and you release a lot of uh, allo antigen in the in the body of the recipients at a time when you also want to reduce immunosuppression because the graph is not functioning. So I think it's actually uh, I don't think that there there are some data epidemiological data I mean because I think much patients undergoing this procedure. At least none that I've seen, but I would I would think as an immunologist that this is a risky situation for allosensitization with all the consequences that we discussed during the talk about the fact that these patients are going to be more difficult to return to. Can I ask uh, uh, all of you uh, one issue which wasn't maybe discussed? If a uh, if, uh, graft is failing because of polyoma virus, uh, would you change anything in terms of uh, uh, immunosuppression and what to do uh, uh, in terms of removing? Okay. Yeah, is the, um, so um, current guidelines, like the American uh, Society of Transplantation guidelines, they uh, recommend to first try and achieve um, a resolution of uh, viremia uh, before um, a retransplant, of course, because of a, a big concern that this ongoing uh, big BK viremia it indicates insufficient specific immune control. And if you um, retransplant the patients, you give them even more immune suppression, so it could become worse. Um, it, it, um, you could infect the next kidney or the, the, the donor virus in the, in the second kidney could reactivate. So it seems like a very dangerous thing to do, although there's hardly any data available in the literature on what actually happens if you would transplant a patient with a high BK viremia and just don't do anything about it. But uh, so it, it's generally recommended not to do it and, and to, to try and um, um, get a viral clearance. Uh, once you uh, achieved viral clearance, data suggests that the outcomes of a next um, transplant will be favorable. So, so you, you can do it, but you have first try and get the viremia gone. So I think this, you always have to take everything into account, the pros and the cons of immune suppression, but I think this is an indication for a, a rapid uh, redu reduction in immune suppression after graft loss and a good monitoring of the BK viremia. So hopefully this will do the trick and you will, uh, it will be resolved. If not, I think there is uh, an indication for a graft nephrectomy because it's, it's the BK virus in the donor that's really causing the viremia. So you can uh, relieve the burden 
of the virus and uh, typically you see a very um, um, fast drop in viremia after uh, a transplant nephrectomy. Um, well, I'm, I'm not totally uh, sure that uh, you will remove the load of virus uh, doing the allograft nephrectomy in a case of BK uh, nephropathy. I totally agree about a rapid uh, uh, withdrawal of immunosuppression to, to decrease the viral load. But since we know that the, the BK virus is in the uh, urinary tract, it's not in, in the parenchyma, not much, that much in the parenchyma, you'll still leave some urinary tract after the nephrectomy. So uh, I, I'm not that sure that uh, it plays a, really a role in uh, uh, decreasing or facilitating the healing from BK nephropathy. We, we, I usually don't do it. But, but there are data that, that showed that it, it rapidly decreases afterwards. Well, because it's well, small, small, uh, small numbers of cases, of course. Yeah, it's, it's probably because you stop immunosuppression, I, in, in my understanding, but yeah. Um, Lucretia, can I ask you two questions? Uh, because you made some interesting comments in your presentation. So, um, first of all, the key digo, um, that paragraph reads to me very clearly that they are absolutely against nephrectomy. Um, is that correct or should we revise that? Well, uh, they, they say that it shouldn't be done unless it's uh, necessary. So, if possible, it should be avoided. And I think that everyone wants to avoid surgery unless it's uh, necessary. We need to show when it is necessary because Olivier will probably show that we, if we want to decrease sensitization, we will have to perform allograft nephrectomy. So we need more data before giving this kind of recommendation. That's why I would suggest to work together, Luke, um, Descartes and uh, Akita about this topic, as Gabby suggested uh, in his e on him his email today, I, I think that's something we should consider to refine a bit. I mean, it's a very clearly an interesting topic, judging by the number of participants online and the questions that are coming through. Um, my a quick question to you and a quick answer: Is there ever a role for an nephrectomy done at the same time of retransplant? Well, it has happened. Uh, sometimes you look at the CT scan and you have the feeling that you have enough room for placing another kidney, for example, if you have a third or a fourth transplant. I think uh, that the highest number, I mean, my highest number was a fifth. I've seen in the literature there was a case with seven and that was in Belgium. Am I right, Rachel? Uh, so, yeah, if you have uh, a patient with two, three, four kidneys uh, and they, they, they are there for a long time, sometimes we have to consider that kidneys are like beans. They're very, very small. We don't need to remove them. What are you removing? You don't even find it. So, yeah, in some cases you may go to, to, to a transplant and find that there is something bothering you in place in the kidney and that's so fast you just ligate and take it out. Yeah, so I think that is the case when you may want to do it uh, at the same time. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Adrian, go on. We have some questions from the yeah. audience. Uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me try and synthesize two questions from the audience uh, for uh, Olivier and Luke. Uh, um, so if we have a patient which is really highly sensitized, uh, even after nephrectomy, would you continue some uh, a little bit of uh, immunosuppression? Uh, and uh, what do you think also of uh, uh, rapam rapamycin in, in these patients uh, uh, instead of uh, other, other reg regimens? Interesting question. Uh, and if I understood well what you mean by a patient that is already uh, sensitized, you mean that the patient has already donor specific antibodies against any of the HLA molecule of the graft. Yeah. Yeah. And in that case, you uh, could argue that they cannot be worse. And if you stop immunosuppression, nothing is going to happen. And I would tend to agree. And actually, in the Desir study, what we did to avoid to have this type of patients where it's impossible to show that there's a benefit to remove the, the, the allograft because the patient is already sensitized. We have invented something, well, I suppose we invented it because I never found the, the trace of this type of things anywhere, but we call it the uh, immunogenic residual potential, which means that we calculate the number of epitopes, the, the, mis the epitope mismatch between donor recipients. 
And if the percentage is extremely low, meaning that there is not that many epitope left on the graft against which the, the, the recipient is not immunized, then we, we consider that we can stop immunospression that we will not do much, much more damage than it's already done as far as the sensitization is concerned. And the second part of the question was relative to the mTOR and mTOR. Yeah, so it's uh, it's funny because I'm a little bit schizophrenic about these type of drugs. At the same time, I think they are very interesting for uh, uh, the work we are conducting in my lab about NK mediated rejection, which is completely different topics. But uh, I should say that there are many data in the literature suggesting that they may not be as efficient as CNI to prevent uh, allosensitization. I believe it's because they are less well tolerated and that patients tend to not take them as well as they do for the CNI. Because as far as the immunologic point of view is concerned, they should be at least as efficient. But uh, being pragmatic, I would tend to think that uh, uh, if we do not have good reason to leave this mTOR, for instance, a, a cancer or something like that, then I would let the patients on CNI, which are easier to manage uh, when it's back on dialysis. And I would tend to uh, hem for a trot level between three to five, because we know that below three of tacrolimus, there is no real immunosuppressive effect. Above five is probably too much, and we don't have, uh, maybe that's very empirical. Thank you. Luke, would you add anything? Well, I think I agree with, uh, with uh, Olivier. Um, and in the um, patients that it is already immunized and had a graft nephrectomy, I don't think there's a strong argument to still continue the immunosuppression. Uh, I would favor to reduce the immunosuppression um, once the graft uh, has been removed um to protect uh, the patient against the potential side effects of uh, long-standing immunosuppression during dialysis um, and with respect to the mTOR inhibitors i think the main indication that we have for mTOR inhibitors now is um, to uh, avoid the nephrotoxic uh, effects of uh, the calcium urine inhibitors but that point is not relevant anymore uh, if there is graft failure so then we can return to uh, to the the calcium urine inhibitors, which are, in my view, are better tolerated in patients with a, a bad graft function than mTOR inhibitors. Yeah. Thank Gabby? you, uh, Luke. Thank you both. So, um, I mean, it's a fascinating discussion. Time is running uh, short, uh, but one quick question. Is there a situation different for pediatrics? Should we do different things in pediatric recipients? And I know we don't have a lot of time to answer that complex question. Can I can tell you very quickly that uh, you have, it depends how small is the child. Sometimes having a kidney, uh, it means that you don't have room for another kidney. And that's one point. And then there is a second point about adherence. Uh, we keep saying, okay, the patient will be still on immunosuppression, but are we sure that the patient will take it? We are not even sure that they take it when they are protecting their graft. So uh, are they really keen to keep having immunosuppression although they are on dialysis? I think that kids might be um, a different population. So the answer is, uh, I think that at least in France, kids are prioritized to get uh, a transplant, which means that they're usually not well matched or less well matched than adults. So the risk of sensitization is higher while they are the population that we will need to retransplant uh, more. So yes, I think that in their case, being very, very um, cautious about the risk of sensitization is important and the strategy we're discussing on the kids. Uh, similarly, one last uh, question related a very short answer. If the patient is old enough and clearly he will not have a, not have a retransplant, would you uh, uh, still have uh, all of you uh, um, uh, the idea of an nephrectomy? No, I would try, well, at least in my center, we would try to avoid uh, the nephrectomy and reduce the risk uh, of a long exposure to immunosuppressive drugs by doing the, this, this strategy of slowly, slowly decreasing the drug, trying to avoid the, the, the intolerance syndrome. Uh, that would be the best possibility. But you've seen in the, in the studies that I was presenting that the risk for these patients to die is extremely high. And actually, more than 50% of them are, are gone after three years. So that's a wait and see policy and um, uh, some of these patients will develop a graft intolerance syndrome and then you can do a nephrectomy at that time 
<laughs> there is there are some some factors that can be helpful to predict the risk of a graft uh, intolerance syndrome. We know that um, if patients had an uh, an episode of acute uh, rejection. Um, that's one factor. If uh, the the time uh, after interval after transplantation is relatively short, and if the recipient is younger, these are three factors that increase the um, the chance of developing a graft intolerance syndrome. It can be helpful to make a decision uh, together with the patient, and also to be prepared on the chance that the patient will develop graft intolerance syndrome. So diagnosing it early when um, he develops or she develops complaints that are compatible with this syndrome. And just to, to, I agree with Luke, and I would add that in these particular patients, if they are very comorbid, we would try to treat the intolerance syndrome by just the, the body of corticosteroids and then slowly tapering, which is a strategy that we do not use in youngster. I like to, like Intesha said, we tend to couple this body of corticosteroid with a nephrectomy, but if the patient is very comorbid, we would try to just treat it if we can with the, with the drugs. Gabi? Um, I think we should close and um, um, over to you, Adrian, for the final comments. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was an extremely interesting question uh, uh, and answer uh, session and the extremely uh, interesting presentations and the comments by the panelists. Um, we really are grateful to you guys. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, this should develop probably into a um, bilateral uh, document uh, from the uh, two organizations and uh, uh, by the questions that, that UDL uh, asked uh, uh, to the dialysis community is one of the top three most relevant um, uh, topics in the dialysis uh, world currently. And uh, that would be surprising uh, probably to many, uh, but uh, this hour uh, showed that there are a lot of issues, a lot of controversial issues where we would need uh, more research, of course, uh, but also a sort of uh, uh, guidance and to have uh, at least an expert uh, controversy conference and maybe both ESOT and your IDTA uh, could have the first uh, controversy conference uh, uh, in this very important issue. Thank you very much to you guys. Thank you, and uh, allow me to add my thanks on behalf of ESOT um, and thank the um, a part the well the speakers and the panelists for the fantastic job. Uh, thank you all for staying online and listening to all this, and hopefully we got some ideas for for clinical practice. Um, and look forward to seeing you in Athens at the ESOT Congress and at future collaborative meetings. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>